a warm welcome to this study day for St Bennet's Church, Cambridge. We're delighted to have with us Rupert Short, exploring the credibility of the Christian faith, particularly in relation to the challenges posed by Dawkins and others. As the subtitle of Rupert's latest book indicates, this is God for Grown-Ups. Drawing on philosophy, theology, world faiths and science, in these talks Rupert demonstrates that Christianity is both coherent and credible. There are three videos to watch which will remain up on our YouTube channel for wider use and you're very welcome to join in conversation and discussion with Rupert on Saturday the 21st of November at 11 o'clock via Zoom. Joining details are on the church's website, www.stbennettschurch.org. This study day is part of our learning and formation programme, and the website will also give you more details about that, as well as other aspects of life at St Bennett's. For 20 years, Rupert Short was religion editor for the Times Literary Supplement. He's a research associate at the Von Hugel Institute here in Cambridge, and the author of a number of books, including God is No Thing, and most recently, Outgrowing Dawkins. I recently met an old friend at a party. She works for a Christian NGO. Later that evening, we were introduced to a man with a background in software engineering. Having learnt about my friend's job and then discovered that she goes to church, He asked her how old she thinks the universe is. Her jaw dropped a bit, but she was composed enough to reply with a counter question. Did you know, she asked, that it was a Catholic priest, that's to say the the cosmologist, George Lemaitre, who proposed the Big Bang Theory in the first place? Now it was the engineer's turn to look shocked. Some may dismiss this exchange as a flash in the pan. To others, though, it will reflect a dialogue of the deaf evident across Western culture and beyond. The frustration felt by the second group is well-founded in my view. Popular contemporary attitudes towards religion often include condescending dismissal. The same applies to large sections of the media, universities and the arts establishment. Faith groups must bear their share of the blame for this, but so must the strident atheists who reject what they have never taken the trouble to investigate beyond a superficial level, especially those who write bestsellers ridiculing belief systems they know so little about. So how might scientifically informed religious believers defend the coherence of their worldview? If they are Christians, say, Part of their answer might derive from a comment of Timothy McDermott, uh, a theologian and professor of computer science who's had a, a great influence on me personally. And he has written, quote, the aim of God's creation is that creation should help make itself. And the scriptures are humanly written and developed history riddled with ambiguities and dead ends and full starts. Nevertheless, they are powerfully challenging calls to humanity to grow and reform and criticise itself." This sort of judgment could be voiced in allied ways across the spiritual spectrum. We have a deep respect for science. People of various stripes often add. We just don't think that this way of investigating the world exhausts all of reality. In particular, there is no contradiction between accepting Darwin's theories and belief in God. Young Earth creationists and advocates of intelligent design are therefore mistaken. But so too are those who assume an unbridgeable divide between science and religion. Four reasons, especially, might be cited in favour of such a model. The first is intellectual. Honest inquirers should follow the evidence where it leads, whether or not they practice a faith. There is nothing pious or wishful about this. A pillar of Christian orthodoxy, such as St Thomas Aquinas, would have insisted on the unitary character of truth. If science, for example, establishes that water boils at 100 degrees Celsius, 
or that the world is 13.7 billion years old, then these and other discoveries cannot be credibly challenged from any pulpit. The second reason is theological. Classical teaching in various traditions, Eastern as well as Western, incidentally, represents God not as a big thing competing for space with lesser things, but as the ground of existence. One useful analogy is that of the author in relation to his or her characters. While not himself a cast member of War and Peace, Tolstoy nevertheless inhabits every line of the narrative. Another analogy is supplied by light. The light in which we see is not one of the objects seen, because we see light only in as much as it is reflected off opaque objects. Think also of our eye. It's, it's by, by means of our eye, by dint of our eye, that we see anything at all. But we can't see our own eyes. The, the eye is, is the ground of our vision. And I think this is what people, this is the kind of analogy that people are striving to, to conjure up when they uh, talk about what the, the classical traditions mean in different ways uh, in referring to God. So, nature has its own integrity according to the laws and patterns established by science. To repeat, God is not a micromanager intervening here and there. Nor is the relationship between God and the world like that of a builder to a house. Things are both subtler and more intimate from a monotheistic standpoint. As a canvas supports a painting or a singer holds a song, God sustains everything in being moment by moment. That's to say creation is something going on right now, uh, not just something that is believed to have taken place a very long time ago. God's sustaining power operates at a lower level, uh, off, off our immediate radar, you might say. So when someone turns on the gas to heat up a, a pan of water to make a cup of tea, for example, chemistry can give a full account in its own terms of the process involved. But a Hindu or a Muslim or a Jew or a Christian can still maintain that God makes the whole situation exist, the gas, its power and its action on the water. God and the gas work at different levels, not in competition. Divine being is also seen as unfathomable in the major faiths. God may be loved, but not thought, as a classic such as the cloud of unknowing puts it. By love may he be gotten and holden, but by thought never. Believers can nonetheless combine humility in the face of a profound mystery with a calm certainty about what God is not. In the case of a figure like Richard Dawkins, by contrast, things are turned upside down. Starting with an utterly inadequate definition of God as an angry tyrant up in the sky, he then informs us that this monster doesn't exist. It's a true belief widely shared by many people on either side of the religious divide. But why should it necessarily be an argument for atheism rather than a spur to resist idolatry? Initial mistakes breed larger ones when unchecked. If I say that my favourite drink is beer, and you reply that yours is wine, we are at least agreed on what it is that we disagree about. But since the deity in whom Dawkins disbelieves is a blown-up creature, he has even gone on to make the surreal claim that our supposed creator would, would need to have evolved through natural selection, and there is no evidence available of any life form more sophisticated than humankind. In other words, God, quote unquote, is being pictured as both the cause of the universe and a product of it. Fallacies rarely come larger than this. Our third reason is textual. Let us focus on the Christian narrative for now, since it has prompted so much derision, at least in English speaking circles. Are those who take the first chapters of Genesis literally some atheists, as well as creationists, as we have seen, are they really reading the Bible in an appropriate way? Countless mainstream voices would say no. The essential message of Genesis is that God has invited the world into being, 
But from the start, things have gone seriously wrong with humanity. Despite this, however, God has not given up on us. We will only contrast good modern science, so-called, with that bad kind found in scripture, if we make the category mistake of reading Genesis as a biological textbook. A common tactic employed by skeptics involves showing how fundamentalist interpretations of the creation story in Genesis 2 or the, or the Genesis 9 flood narrative are incompatible with their scientific account. So far so good, though a little bit easy and contemptuous. These pundits then identify the biblical picture with a fundamentalist interpretation. That shows a lamentable surrender to the fundamentalist mode of thought, which any self-respecting scientist uh, should know how to resist. Yes, many believers did read Genesis simplistically before the modern era, though by no means all. St. Augustine, perhaps the most influential thinker in Christian history, argued in the fourth century that since the sun and the moon were not created until the fourth day, the creation story was better understood figuratively. And Orthodox Christianity, in any case, does not hold the Bible to be factually inerrant. Scripture itself nowhere claims such a status. Prizing a text Believing that it discloses the truth of our condition with unique richness is not the same as holding every word of it to be infallible. And the Protestant fundamentalism on which the new atheists rely for plausibility is a new kid on the block in historical terms, owing much to the culture wars in the United States. Our fourth reason is historical. The myth that science and religion are and always have been in conflict is vital to sustain trench warfare between the two polarised forces already referred to, creationists and supporters of intelligent design on the one hand, and on the other, those who dismiss all religion as fundamentally irrational. Yet Copernicus, Galileo, Descartes, Newton, Leibniz, Faraday, James Clark Maxwell and other builders of the modern world were men of deep religious conviction as well as scientific geniuses. What's more, their work was preceded by that of medieval pioneers, Muslims and Jews as well as Christians, often working in productive dialogue. Of course, there has been tension between science and theology at times, a classic example being the Oxford debate between T.H. Huxley and Samuel Wilberforce in 1860 although much of the reporting, even of this encounter, is skewed. Take a broader view, however, and you may be struck by how flexible many Christians and others have been in absorbing new knowledge. As is often noted, before castigating Galileo, a process more due to the clash of confrontational uh, individuals and, and other factors than to scientific matters per se, before that, the Catholic Church had jettisoned biblical cosmology in favour of a Greek model based on the movement of the spheres. Understanding the geological record and its implications for biblical timelines was a task undertaken within a predominantly Christian culture. Francis Spufford, in his uh, wonderful book, Unapologetic, makes the point with characteristic verve, quote, there's a good case to be made that the ready acceptance of evolution in Britain owed a lot to the great cultural transmission mechanism of the, of the Church of England. If you're glad that Darwin is on the £10 note, hug an Anglican, unquote. Among scholars in this field, it is widely accepted that two works in particular encapsulate the warfare narrative. John William Draper's History of the Conflict Between Religion and Science, uh, a book that appeared in 1875, and Andrew Dixon writes uh, A History of the Warfare of Science with Theology in Christendom, which uh, appeared about 20 years later. No professional historian now takes these works seriously. It's, it's very important, I think, to, to emphasise that. Though many of the so-called facts listed in these books were, were made up, the damage they caused endures, however. As a biologist, 
Dennis Alexander has observed, researchers are still correcting what he calls the factual mutants created by Draper and Dixon White. A much more objective survey of the terrain can be found in a work entitled Galileo Goes to Jail and Other Myths About Science and Religion, edited by Ronald Numbers. Amid much else, this book shows that multiple features of contemporary science were nurtured in theological soil. Among them, trust in the intelligibility of the world, the concept of physical laws and empiricism itself. The founders of the Royal Society in 17th century England wrote of how their Christian faith impelled them to explore their surroundings. The father of natural history, John Ray, was a Puritan. Christians in the 20th century, such as the Anglican R.A. Fisher and the Orthodox Theodosius Dobzhansky, did much to develop the neo-Darwinian consensus. In our own day, it is not just figures of no religious allegiance, but also Martin Novak, a Harvard-based Roman Catholic, and Simon Conway Morris, another Anglican, who are contributing significantly to evolutionary theory. One obvious corollary of all this is that a substantial portion of recent public discourse, especially in Europe and North America, is redundant. I refer, of course, to New Atheism and especially its best-known exponents nicknamed the Four Horsemen. Richard Dawkins, author of The God Delusion and now of uh, Outgrowing God, A Beginner's Guide to, to Atheism, is perhaps this posse's most dogged member. Adjacent furrows on the same patch have been ploughed by the late Christopher Hitchens in God is Not Great, Sam Harris in uh, his book The End of Faith, and Daniel Dennett in Breaking the Spell. Stephen Fry, dear, dear, dear Stephen Fry, so, so entertaining and so, so bright, not, not necessarily the world's most reliable guy to the theological scene. Uh, he, he, he is one of their foremost celebrity cheerleaders and has likened them to the, the four musketeers. I think, incidentally, that the martial language there is, is entirely apt. These men are able gunslingers and sword wielders. Um, what they can't really handle very effectively are scalpels. And so often in a, in a debate like this, it's, it's scalpels and other delicate instruments that are really needed. Don't take my word for it alone. Since church teaching, or rather wholesale travesties of it, uh, is made to do duty for religion in general throughout the God delusion, the book has drawn full-scale rebuttals from Christian writers. The former atheist and biochemist turned theologian Alistair McGrath employed a steady hand in, in his book, The Dawkins Delusion. David Bentley Hart, uh, the American theologian and philosopher, opted for lethal force in his book, Atheist Delusions. So did Edward Fazer uh, in a, a, a book called The Last Superstition. And the philosopher, Dennis Turner, has protested that there is scarcely a single proposition of St Thomas Aquinas' theology that Dawkins is able to formulate accurately enough to succeed in accurately denying. Maybe most notable of all is the hostility Dawkins has prompted among his fellow non-believers. Terry Eagleton, critic and literary theorist, famously began his review of The God Delusion in the London Review of Books as follows, quote, imagine somebody holding forth on biology whose only knowledge of the subject is the British Book of Birds, and you have a rough idea what it feels like to read Richard Dawkins on theology. Anthony Kenny, one of the world's most distinguished agnostic thinkers, has described Dawkins' writings on religion as, quote, marked by tendentious paraphrase, imputation of bad faith, outright insult, unquote. Kenny was himself once a priest before losing his faith and becoming an academic. Another renowned philosopher, John Gray, has never held religious beliefs of any kind, yet his book Seven Types of Atheism is especially critical of Dawkins for displaying the same provinciality of mind as the most stiff-necked believer. You will find more insight into the subject of faith in the opening pages of Gray's excellent book than in either of Dawkins's two screeds in their entirety. 
considered to a major article by Giovanni, Giovanni Tizzo, published in the summer 2019 issue of New Humanist magazine on the failure of new, new atheism. The piece is significant in drawing attention to the movement's wider cultural ramifications, not just its unfocused grasp of its targets. Tiso condemns the horseman's shared tone as a, quote, a mix of assured belligerence and petulant self-regard, unquote. Their bid to establish their own status as truth seekers is hollow because it involves laying waste to a largely imaginary opponent. They go on, Tiso adds Riley, to ask how a person of faith should suppose them to be arrogant and shrill when it is all the fault of believers for swallowing such naive creeds in the first place. But you will have got one of the points that I've made so far. People can be very mistaken, they can still be very popular, they can say inaccurate things, but mud can stick. And this is why I think patience may work is needed to, to try to resist the misconceptions and why I myself have, have weighed into the debate with, with my little book, uh, Responding to Outgoing God, which is uh, Outgoing Dawkins, God for Grown-Ups. Let me just uh, add that insofar as Dawkins, Dennett, Harris and Hitchens oppose superstition, narrow-mindedness and hostility to science, then their complaints are, of course, welcome, if hardly new. Let's uh, at least concede that point. It's an important point. The trouble, though, is that any virtues in their writings on faith are deflected by the vices of distortion and intellectual imperialism. As suggested, the distortions lie in taking the weakest possible statements of the case for belief and ridiculing them as though they were the only versions going. To win a serious argument, as opposed to a shouting match, you need the honesty and the grit to engage with a robust version of your opponent's case. The imperialism derives, I would suggest, from too sparse an account of human reason. Too sparse an account of human reason. Outgrowing God, Richard Dawkins' uh, book, is fluently written and a salute to biology, as well as a blunt statement of the case for atheism. Myth-making darkness, the subject of the opening chapters, gives way in later sections to scientific light. There is an admirable account of today's scientific consensus on how the biosphere evolved. Readers are then invited to be proud of it, to pity poor myth-makers, scorn creationists, and scratch their heads over the inadequate rationality of non-atheists. Firm direction is given on when to applaud and when to snigger. And here, sadly, is the reason why Dawkins' latest book cannot be recommended to beginners or anyone else other than an object lesson in the perils of trashing what you don't understand. It is pitched at a younger audience in the register of Ernst Gombrich's a Little History of the World. Now, among the virtues of that classic is its objectivity. Dawkins, however, consistently mars a good scientific story with spin. His conclusions are so callow overall that they might be summed up as resting on a single dodgy syllogism. Major premise, evolution by natural selection is incompatible with belief in a creator God. Minor premise, Evolution by natural selection is true. Conclusion, so-called, belief in a creator God is false. Aside from reaffirming their acceptance of Darwin's theories and thus denying Dawkins' major premise, there are many other things people of faith might want to say in response. One is that their convictions cannot be separated from the personal commitment supplying an overarching context to their lives. In other words, they haven't thought they were their way into a new way of living, but lived their way into a new way of thinking. This is hardly to employ soft-headedness. Many who share this outlook supplement it with a muscular claim that belief in God is a valid inference of philosophical reflection. Belief in God is a valid inference of philosophical reflection. 
That's to say, the world is not self-created. Existence is on loan from a source. The, philo the philosophical stance known as naturalism entails a confidence that everything can ultimately be explained in the language of natural science. But it is not possible in the terms naturalism allows to say how anything at all can exist. People of faith may amplify that vision by drawing on a maxim of the philosopher Eugene Gendlin. We think more than we can say, he wrote. We feel more than we can think. We live more than we can feel. And there is so much else besides. In a similar way, believers might add, perceiving God's presence is a far cry from knowing what God is. Note the expansive understanding of a word such as reasonable here. To develop our earlier observation, the thoughtful Muslim or Jew or Hindu or Christian is essentially saying, although faith cannot or should not contradict science, there are all sorts of statements, starting with ethics, that I hold true, but which cannot be demonstrated in a test tube. It isn't reasonable to think that only reason defined in one narrow way discloses the world to us. The grain of reality is revealed by a combination of reason and our moral and aesthetic impulses. This is the context in which spiritual belief may enter the picture. Simply stated, Dawkins' doctrine is that the only meaningful affirmations are those deriving from natural science. The snag, as any school student of philosophy will tell you, is that this is not itself a proposition of natural science. Whether the claim is true or false, in other words, it follows that there is at least one fact that isn't a physical fact. This was the basic lesson apparently learned after the bubble of logical positivism burst before the Second World War. Dawkins's book, Outgrowing God, has little that is even handed to say about the practical results of the religious enterprise, both within communities of belief and across society more broadly. It is plain that Dawkins considers faith to be a source of much more harm than good, and not just by filling people's heads with false beliefs. A dispassionate person will want to grant that religion can of course go terribly wrong on occasion. So can other forms of kinship bond, including patriotism and family life, not to mention politics. Suppose Dawkins had announced that all left-wing endeavour is bogus in theory and ruinous in practice because of the horrors perpetrated by Stalin, Mao and Fidel Castro. Would he be given the time of day by political scientists worth their salt? The other side of the picture ought to be equally evident. As well as being rich manifestations of culture, the major faiths are also vast sources of social capital and charitable outreach. Spiritually inspired conviction has mobilized millions uh, <clears throat> to, to oppose authoritarian regimes, inaugurate democratic transitions, and support human rights. Weighing up how much harm quote-unquote, religion does, relative to good, is or should be a matter of patient sifting, as I have already indicated. Dawkins might have done better to call his book Outgrowing False Gods. But for that project, he would have had to undertake serious research, generating far fewer headlines. He would also have needed to outgrow the winner-takes-all mentality that so mars his writing in this area. Whence all the anger combined with the tunnel vision? Well, it's not my place to offer a full explanation. What Dawkins does tell us is that he had a brief encounter with Christianity in the form of public school religion during the 1950s, between the ages of 13 and 15, before concluding that belief in God was about as credible as trusting in the tooth fairy. Those views seem to have been set in aspic ever since. He does not reveal that he has had numerous opportunities to revisit his adolescent certainties without ever apparently feeling the slightest urge to do so. Several rebuttals of the God delusion have already been cited, but as far back as 1992, 
uh, in the uh, pre-internet era, Dawkins debated theistic belief with uh, John Habgood, both a scientist by training and then Archbishop of York. Habgood made all the points one might expect from a man of very broad range, ready to see things in the round. Science is about explanation, while religion centres on interpretation, he observed. God does not enter into the scientific account of nature because the objectives and methods of science shut out anything, any hint of purpose or intention or feeling or value, which might point to a creator. That is not a criticism of science. It is a description of what science is and the key to what makes it so successful in studying those aspects of reality in which purpose, feeling, value, and so on are not part of the story. Habgood's view complements that of a Jewish leader, such as Jonathan Sachs, God rest him, who argues that while science takes things apart to see how they work, religion puts them together to see what they mean. It's a great soundbite, I think. Let me repeat it. Science takes things apart to see how they work. Religion puts them together to see what they mean. The right attitudes of religion to good science should always be admiration and thankfulness, Sachs adds. Uh, but there is more to wisdom than science, he goes on. It cannot tell us why we are here or how we should live. Science masquerading as religion is as unseemly as religion masquerading as, as science. It will be clear from the drift of comments made so far that outgrowing God calls for further on scrambling. And to this I will turn in my next presentation. Let me end this overview on a constructive note, however. I've emphasised uh, elsewhere in, in my writings the intellectual appeal of Darwinism and my confidence that Richard Dawkins, at his most constructive, poses challenges to Christianity and other faiths that cannot be brushed aside casually. Look around you, not only at man's inhumanity to man, but also at the waste and suffering occasioned by the development of life over hundreds of millions of years, and you may indeed have questions about the biblical notion that we have a divine source and a supernatural destiny. For this reason, among others, I've never doubted the reasonableness of atheism. It is not on un uh, unbelief as such I am seeking to contest. Only the dogmatic scorning of religious belief in principle and my reflections, uh, and above all my argument that Christians can hold their head high with intellectual integrity, um, however well-versed in philosophy and science they, they may be. Uh, this uh, argument of, of mine is offered to the fair-minded in a spirit of openness.